Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator big honor of uh, introducing Dr. Uvo Onoriobe. Uh, he has completed his bachelor's of dental surgery degree at the University of Benin, Nigeria. He obtained a master's in public health degree from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2011. He also completed a residency in dental public health in North Carolina oral health section in 2012. He went to complete the advanced standing program for internationally trained dentists and obtained a DMD degree from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2016. Uvo has worked in private practice for a, a couple of three years. He is honored to be a part of the graduate prosthodontics program at the University of Michigan. He's the executive director Healing Hands uh, Health Society, a nonprofit in the USA and Nigeria. And he is the facilitator, or maybe co facilitator now with me. No, I'm just kidding, of uh, the dental <laughs> webinar series. <laughs> I'm super excited to hear about this topic because this is such an important topic for, um, uh, for, for implants with dentures. So take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Uh Thank you so much for uh, this. This is an, it's an interesting. This is quite. Um, I've always been. I, I told myself I, I just want to facilitate. I just want to make sure things are happening. But I, I realized that uh, being in uh, in this field has um, uh, has showed me a lot. You, there's so much to learn. Uh, it's as though I've been going to school forever. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> you know, uh, there's so much to learn, and uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, restorative space in terms of uh, do you, uh, so, so, so uh, the, this webinar series started in May, and today we've, have, we've had over, over 50 speakers who have given of their time. I just want to say thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone in, in different countries. I, I had uh, Nigeria in mind, and today we have over uh, attendees from 40 countries. Um, this, it's amazing. Uh, I just want to thank you guys, and hopefully uh, we are we are winding down uh, October and November. Are going to be the last um, month that I can see right now, <laughs> and then we are going to move on to an online course. You will have to register uh, for that if you want to be part of the online course, and there's going to be a certificate uh, given. Um, we are in talks with University of Benin. Uh, who will host that for us. Anyway, today we're talking about treatment planning, the available restorative space. You know, uh, you know we're all looking forward to uh, patients um, with the right outcomes. You know, you, people, the, your patients come to you and they want, uh, some of them are really concerned about how it looks, aesthetics. Um, most people want to be able to speak properly. Most of my patients say, I can't eat, you know, the dog, I need some teeth, I, I, you know, and um, uh, some of them don't have the confidence. People are covering their face, you know, today we have, we're all putting on face masks. That has, that has helped a little bit, but, you know, once all that goes away, where does your self-confidence come from? People want to be comfortable. And at the end of the day, you want a prosthesis that will stand the tense, test of time, long-term. So we're talk talking about long-term. If you, if you want to go, you know, somebody says that if you want to go fast, you go alone, <laughs> you know, and, and we're talking about how do you ensure that your work, uh, this, this patient of mine, this is a patient of mine, um, when he was leaving, when I gave him his prosthesis, he said, <laughs> he said doc, I'm not coming back. <laughs> 
that could be a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> but in this case, it was a good thing. He was happy. He just couldn't wait to get home. He just couldn't wait to go for his family, family reunion. He just couldn't wait to go eat outside with friends. And that, those were things that he couldn't do in a long time. So, so that is what we want to achieve. So how do you do that? You know, we all wish to satisfy our patients by providing solutions um, with, a, with a description of how long it's going to last. You know, so when you, when you provide your procedures to your patients, you should be able to say, or hey, we, we, I, I wish we live in a world where you say, you know, okay, you know, based on evidence-based practices, you know, that is what we do right now. This is going to last you 10 years. Can you put a, can you put a time to the things that you do? I mean, there are so many factors there's the operator factor. There is the operator competency factor. Uh, sometimes it is your technician competency issue. And you also have a patient biologic factors. There are so many other factors uh, that affect whether or not your, what you are giving to your patient is going to stand the test of time. Uh, the ACP has come up with a, a, you know, a diagnostic index, a criteria. I, I think trying to make a diagnosis, I know we're talking about treatment planning, but you should be able to say, um, classify your patients based on the difficulty level. Class one is an ideal, minimally compromised. You are sure, this is like your regular case. You know, you're sure you're doing, you have, there are not, not so many complications. In class two, is moderately compromised, some tissue loss. Uh, you need the help of uh, uh, another, um, you know, practitioner, maybe a, an orthodontist or maybe an oral surgeon, a periodontist. Class three, substantially compromised. Class four, severely. You should be able to class your patient when you see them. In what class do they belong? So that tells you, how difficult it is. And if it's difficult, then what's the prognosis? How long is it going to last? Are you able, are you able to achieve um, your outcome that you're looking out for? Should you be handing this over to somebody else? Is this a case you don't need to be doing? You know, sometimes you need, we all need to look at our patients all over again. I know, you know, for the reasons you, know, you want to be able to deal with this, but sometimes, you know, being able to know uh, where your, your, your limits are based on the location of the edentulous area, based on the condition of the abutment, do you need to do a crown lengthening? Do, does this tooth need some, so does it need a, a, a root canal and, and, and a crown? Does it need, you know, what's your occlusal skin? Is it totally collapsed? Is the bite, is the OVD change? Are you sure you should be handling it? Do you, what is it gonna take you? So, you, you know, residual reach, you have enough reach. It's your prosthesis is going to contain some gingiva colored uh, portion of it. So all that uh, kind of helps you in making a diagnosis. And then once you can make a diagnosis, then you think you're able to talk about prognosis. How, you know, uh, how long is this prosthesis going to last? Uh, you know, uh, the, the way to longevity uh, and being able to, you know, Predictability of the restoration is, I, I think, is a one-way street. You know, if you, uh, it, it leads from um, uh, having the right case selection. Is this the right case? Should I be handling this? Is, is this within uh, my comfort level? Do I have the expertise? Am I patient enough? Do I have, am I able to attend to the detail that this case, and it comes from making a diagnosis. So if you can make a diagnosis, if you can say, okay, this is uh, difficult, T level two, um, I should be able to handle it. It's a, it's a case I should be doing. Then I can treatment plan for it. Then you can, sh you can be sure that you're on your way to longevity and, and, and you are able to say this is going to last a, a, a long deal. Today, we're talking about restorative space. And, and it's, a, it's a three dimensional space. You know, sometimes when we look at restorative space, you're, you're, you're looking at uh, I'm just going to move my cursor here. So it's a space, it's, it's a volume, not just a length or a width or a height. 
and it, it accommodates the, the particular construct, be it a single implant or an FPD, a bridge, or a full arch case. It provides, the space provides the ideal tooth position. Okay? And it also um, has uh, volume for the material. Because when all these are uh, compromised, then we are in big trouble. Because if you, if you look at it, if you, if you don't look at it as a space, if you look at just length, then you can you, know, you go ahead without calculating how much space you need for, for if you need to have a vision of where you're going and walk back. So this, the, so this is a patient that, that, that came to me uh, uh, in, 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 con, in, in consultation with uh, my perio uh, uh, friends. Uh, so he had an accident and, and I said, well, yes, we are looking at a space. So this, uh, the, the, the restorative space is bounded um, by the occlusal plane, is bounded by the supporting tissues of the dentalus jaw, is also bounded on, on, the, on, on the inside by the tongue and on the outside by uh, the facial tissues and the cheeks. So you're looking at a, a space, not just an inter-arch distance. You're looking at the volume, the entire volume, and you should be able to uh, calculate that this, I have enough space. So in treating this patient, I looked at it and, uh, and one of the first things I saw, I saw this canine, I saw this canine right here. And I'm thinking, you know, can I, can I put a tooth there? How long has, uh, has this space been there? Has there been any um, supra eruption? If I put a tooth there, is it, is it gonna be in conflict? Is it gonna be in harmony? You know, so looking at it as a space, you know, because sometimes it's easy to just say, okay, this person is missing, um, and you know, two teeth. I'm just going to place an implant, and um, you know, and we'll fix it. You know, so so so, so the idea now I, I, I'm proposing, which has already been proposed before, that you should think of it from the look at the finished work and and walk back. Uh, last last week we talked about a crown down approach. You know, from the crown down, from the tip of the crown down to where uh, the, the, the prosthesis is gonna be attached to the implant fixture. You need to have it calculated before you, before you start treatment. You know, I, I can't overemphasize this. Uh, a proper uh, evaluation of a case needs to be done. It takes time to gather information um, Look at it critically. Take diagnostic records. It's, it's, if, 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 if one visit is just to take diagnostic records, then do it. If, if that's what you need. Because sometimes there are some things you don't see unless you have a cast in your hand. There are some things you would not see unless, of course, you have photographs. There are some things you will not see if you're not looking for it. If you're not looking for the smile line, you're not going to see it. If you're not looking for the, 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 the tip of the, 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 the leap, the, the, the leap distance, the length of the leap, if you're not looking out for it, you're not going to see it. If you're not looking at the tip of the nose to see whether it's in alignment, there are some things you just have to have an eye for. This requires some details, and you should um, just have it as, as, as practice. Every patient that comes, um, do a critical evaluation. That is the only way you can have a successful implant construct. And, uh, you know, going back, uh, you know, diagnostic records, you know, appropriate records should be obtained before, before planning. You know, I, uh, this is going to sound a little redundant, but, you know, uh, these are things that we see every day. You know, people, uh, you know, you can get excited about wanting to do a case and you jump into um, the case without gathering the right information. Uh, in some places, uh, having a CBCT image um, is standard of care. Yeah, because the CBCT image is able to give you the exact, you know, the, the, the density of the bone, the quality of the bone, the width of the ridge, the position of the nerve. These are things you need to be able to calculate. I mean, everything is done mostly digitally now. You can 
come up with a surgical guide and without a CBCT, sometimes you, this is you know, grossly impossible. I know I'm speaking to folks where, you know, I know CBCT is available, not available in most of the schools where, where, where this has been taught. And we're hope, hopefully um, we, we can uh, make some change, uh, maybe have a center where um, students can have access to CBCT image in, in Africa. I, I know in South Africa, maybe I'll, I'll talk about it later, do these things, is this standard for your patients? Um, uh, to, to faculty out there, uh, can you make, is it possible to just say, okay, we're gonna have intraoral photographs? You know, it's part of record taking. Preliminary impressions. Today, um, you know, it's digital. You scan the patient and, you know, there's almost a, a seamless flow. There's no alternate. There's no, it's just digital impression and you can do everything. You can print out a 3D model uh, and, and things have changed and it's just, you know, seamless. Uh, so we must um, make it a point of duty to get um, adequate records if we're going to have successful uh, outcomes. Uh, I, I, I threw this in uh, photography. It's something I've come to learn. Uh, photography is uh, painting with light. Um, this is a patient of mine who came in. Uh, she's a um, 69 year old patient who like, she's like, I, 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 I have so much life to live. That's what my patient said. I have so much life to live. Doc, fix me up. I want to be able to, to go out, have a job, I have a life. And, um, and she came in, I, I was just taking photographs. I, I don't think this was a good picture, but in a way I could see her eyes. I could see when she was not there, I could see the aspirations, the hope. She's like, can you do something? I need something quickly. I could, you know, so, so pictures are necessary for uh, gathering that diagnostic record. You just make it part of your practice. I mean, I know having a, you know, you know, I think the best camera, like someone said, is the one you have that you can use. So not necessarily a high tech stuff. The best camera is the one in your hands that works very well to give you, to give you the record that you want to keep. And sometimes you, you need to you know, do some self-evaluation. And photographs uh, are just a good way to show you exactly what you're doing. Take before and after. You know, in shade taking, sometimes we have to take a photograph of, of, of the tooth and send it to the lab such that the lab tries to match. Because sometimes it's very difficult to, to get the right shade, especially if there are various, various um, striations, you know, crazy lines and different details in the, in the tooth uh, surface uh, texture that the photograph can capture. And if for your publications and marketing and branding, photography is just here to stay. It's something you should um, uh, endeavor to include, no matter where you start from. Some people say, you know, if you have a cell phone, go ahead. I mean, I, I, I would say that the, the best camera is the one in your head. I want to talk about uh, what's the characteristics of a good photograph. So when you're taking pictures, is, it, is there a clear center of interest? When you look at a photograph, you see exactly, um, uh, take a look at this picture. A patient came to me and he said, okay, I want, uh, does this picture, is, is this clear in terms of what is, I, I know there's a little shade here. I'll show you some more pictures later, but your photograph should have a clear center of interest. The, 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 the photograph should be well composed. Yeah, I mean, there are various profiles you can use in terms of, you know, left, right, or occlusal views. So that kind of helps you to compose your pictures. So you're looking at the occlusal views for the, for the maxillary arch, you're looking at the occlusal view for the, for the mandibular arch, you're looking at the buccal views for both arches, you're looking at just a, a little smile, uh, a broad smile, you, you should, uh, does your picture tell you what you wanna show? So when you're shooting your pictures, you know, uh, make sure you have enough light. Uh, you know, because without, without light, there's really, you know, you, you must have flash. If you're going to go all the way, you know, then have, I have, I put a, a little cheat sheet here that I think um, would help anyone. It does definitely help me. So if you have a, a, a DSLR camera, um, which is what I, I think, you know, we are going to, you know, this is where the world is, is headed. Yeah. Um, it takes good pictures. Uh, sometimes it's so difficult, you know, okay, I, I don't know the settings, 
these settings, I've talked to various um, photography experts. And, and if you have this, this setting, the ISO of 100, some would say 200, uh, the aperture, the speed time, I, I leave my camera in these settings. So I adjust it once, and these are the settings. I mean, you can copy this, you know, for if it's either you're, if you're using a Nikon or, or a Canon, either Vivio Faithful, white balance for the flash, and the, the color settings, red, green, and blue, and this ISO. So uh, all you need to change is the F settings. So you have this as a basic, uh, the, what's, what's underneath here as a basic setting for your camera. And all you need to change depends on what you're shooting. If you're shooting the portrait view, uh, F10 or F11. If you're doing a close-up view, uh, just change it from F14 or F18. So you just kind of vary just the F number. If you're taking, for most of us will be taking intraoral photographs and lab photography, and you, you need to use F22, F29. I'm telling you with this, you know, with whatever camera you have, whatever DSL camera you have, these settings will definitely give you something when you go back. Sometimes I, I, when I go back, I take a look. There's some things you will never see. There's some details uh, that the lighting and everything gives you that uh, you wouldn't have seen while you're there. and it helps you to um, put a better picture together. So for the portrait, um, F10, F11. And look at it again. ISO of 100, the aperture, the speed time. Just, you, you, need, you, you need this photographs taken pretty quickly, you know, and, and the speed is one over uh, 125 seconds. And, and with that, I can assure you, uh, and, and taking pictures is, is a daily thing. Uh, the more you do it, the more you get. Uh, I can't really say I'm a good photographer. I just take pictures every day. And every day I'm learning, you know, where it, what lights to use, how much lights to to, to use and everything, and you get better on a daily basis. So all this to say that um, <laughs> take good, um, gather information. Because, because we, are, we, are, we are in a position, we are in a situation here, if you do not have uh, an inadequate, if you have an inadequate restorative space, and you go ahead uh, and you make your prosthesis, um, there's gonna be compromise. You're gonna compromise something. And one of the things you're going to compromise is aesthetics, the way it looks. If you have a small space and um, you, you don't have the right volume of material, then it's, not, it's going to look short. It's going to look a funny contour. Um, you're going to be encroaching into this, the intact or closed space. If you have an inadequate space for, for, for the restoration that you made, you're going to have, it's probably going to have um, very suboptimal retention and stability. It's not going to be stable. So this is really, really critical that you, uh, if you don't want to compromise, because people are coming to you, your patients are coming to you, you're trying to satisfy them in terms of aesthetics and the way it looks and function without calculating the space that you need and you go ahead. I'll show us a couple of examples so that we'll see what I'm talking about. Like I said, you know, uh, this, this is a, a patient that came in and we had to just um, reproduce what the patient had in the mouth. And so the patient came in and, and did this prosthesis was always breaking. The patient just had it done uh, after a couple months by sitting in another dental office and the, the prosthesis will always break because it will break because it's structurally weak. It's weak because it doesn't have enough material. It doesn't have enough material because it doesn't, there's not enough, no, not enough space for the material. So they compromise on the acrylic wraparound and the, 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 the patient will always break it. The contour, you know, there, there's a way the, 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 the embrasures go. And if you, if you violate that, it's going to have an imp improper contour. You're going to have a plaque accumulation is the patient is unable to clean it. It affects the gums. I mean, it's one thing leads to another. So, so a space matter is leading you to much bigger problems. It can be avoided if you would, uh, it would just take time uh, to gather information. 
So this is, a, this is a, you know, this is just interesting. About two weeks ago, I was thinking about this, um, the topic to, to, to treat in this webinar. A patient walks up to me and um, I'm like, okay, I, I want to have my implant restored. You know, and it, 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 I, I want you to, I, I would like for you to make your own comment. So, you know, during the questions time, we can talk about this. What would you, you know, it looks like, an, like a simple case, um, but I, I think the spaces should be evaluated during treatment planning to facilitate case selection. Is this a simple case? Should I just jump at it and just, okay, I'm going to do this. All right, we'll just um, uh, take the, the impression and just, you know, you know but, but the first thing I did, I, you know, like always, just take pictures. I took photographs, we looked at it, and the patient, you know, took an impression. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to come up with a plan. Uh, we took an x-ray to see exactly where, uh, uh, where, where the implant fixture is. And um, I, I just asked the patient to do one thing, um, to bite down. So when the patient be down, be down in centric, I said, okay, I guess that is why the person was referred to our clinic. You know, so look at that bite. Is it something I can easily put an abutment here? I can easily, you know, it's, it's a little challenging. How long has he had the space there before they place the implant? Did the patient have a diastema? Because the space left, um, did he have a diastema uh, before he lost his tooth? What, where are his old pictures? Has there been some supra eruption? Because you look at it, you, you, you see, you know, you, you, the, the maxillary teeth, all the teeth have an average size. So if you place a 10, 10 millimeter incisor there, is that gonna be, is that gonna be sufficient? Things, you, you just need to take a look. So I, I want you to say, how would you treat? You, you, would you do this? Would you go ahead? Last week, we talked to Dr. Montin was speaking, and there was a case where um, she had a patient who had um, a small space. And she said something about um, um, placing the implant fixture sub-crestal to gain some space. Was this place, do we need to remove these implants or, or can, we get, can, we, can, we, can we go ahead and carry out some enameloplasty? Can we plastic the tooth? Do we, does the person need um, an angled abutment? Can we repair this tooth without any problems? Will the patient be happy with the outcome? <laughs> Will the outcome last the test of time? Should I be doing this? Should I get some uh, referral, should I, should I talk to somebody about this? So I, you know, so, so these are things, does the patient need some orthodontic intrusion? So you, pl you place it to there because you, is it, we, we need time to train the tissues. Is there gonna be left with a black triangle once you're done treating this case? There's so many questions you, we have time to take a look at now because, you, because the, obviously the, the implant was placed without um, all these questions I'm asking. You know, so the individual went and placed the implant and, you know, and uh, well, it becomes somebody else's problem. You know, go, well, you are being referred out for, for finishing up this case because it's not easy to do. And, um, and they, they, we, the case is still ongoing, but I want you to talk about it. I, I want you to, I want to, I want to hear from you. You know, I, I, want you to, I, I want to hear from you. If you have time, you just type it in. Or if you want to say something about this case, uh, I'll bring you up later on to see what would you do. What are the things that you will think about? And, and here, I know that you have uh, a, lot, a lot of experienced people out there. So if you, if you have any comments, please don't hold back. Uh, this case is still ongoing. I'm going to bring the patient back. And obviously, um, we would have a plan of action. One thing that really helps is having a diagnostic wax up. You know, for the, for the tooth that is missing, try to, you know, make a wax pattern, you know, based on the implant location and direction. Um, 
your closer relationship with the opposing dentition and the aesthetic uh, placement of the teeth. Uh, this, is, this is just more the anterior region. This could be anywhere. It could be the posterior region. Place a tooth there. Make a wax up. Make it stand up for all your cases so that you'll be able to say, okay, yeah, this is a space. This is what, if there's good, and, and do some movements with your articulator so you can tell exactly what you are working with. It is, it is, it is really, uh, it will save you <laughs> some sleepless nights. If just if you notice, okay, right now I see, okay, there is an inter interference. Uh, I need to plaster this seat. This is not going to work. I should take another, another route. A diagnostic wax up, wax up is critical. Because, you know, and the implant fixtures, they, they are ideal dimensions, you know, in terms of ideal, in terms of, okay, yes, we need um, about two, about, say, uh, 10 millimeters of room to be able to fix most things. Three millimeters for the soft tissue, um, five millimeters for the abutment height, and two millimeters for the... Um, material, be porcelain or, or whatever ceramic uh, or metal that you intend to use for your case. You have 10 minutes. Do you have the space? Do you have the space for what you want to, do you have it? And if sometimes, you know, uh, you can use some materials uh, because it gives you um, strength in a very thin section so that kind of you now determines what material you're going to use. if you are using if you have a, a compromised space it now kind of helps you to determine what material you're going to use for for that case the thought here is that things should be restoratively driven you should have the end in mind the end visualize what the final restoration before you start it, have the end in mind and, 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 and plan the prosthesis from the occlusal plane, not from the, the you know, osseous crest, not from the bone. Crown down, from the plane down. You, so you have, do you, so your, your, your crown is not too short. From the, from the occlusal plane, plan your case. Let it be restoratory driven. Because there was a case we were looking at the, uh, a while ago. Um, the implants were placed. I don't think that was driven, you know, by the final plan. Okay, well, you should be able to fix that. That's the assumption. But I think, you know, we are moving towards restorative-driven treatment plans. So the each individual comes in wants a fixed, he wants a fixed, option. He doesn't want anything removable. And we ask ourselves, can we achieve this? Do we have the space? So we take an impression. Uh, this patient came in. Impression of the case was taken, mounted on the articulator. And um, for the, the prosthesis that he needs, he needs about 15 millimeters from the um, incisor edge to the implant platform. Does he have enough space? Can we create the space? Is the space attainable? So all this you can do in the lab uh, in terms of just do the extraction and the, and, and, the, and, the, and the bone reduction on the cast and, and, and fabricate a, a, a test uh, prosthesis in, 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 so that you can say, okay, yes, I can achieve this space before I go ahead and start committing myself to extracting teeth and doing things, you ask yourself, can you, is the patient okay with having bone? Does he have enough bone? Uh, can you remove bone you know, you know, conveniently and still be able to get all the results uh, that you need? So these things should be calculated. You know, take your time to, take your time. Uh, that, that is what I've come to say today. Take your time to look at the case so that you, your case will stand the test of time. There is a, there is a, a study by uh, uh, Abinash Bidra at EGA on the classification of patients. Um, 
It's as though it's, uh, it keeps you taking time trying to decide. I'm, I'm talking about classifying your patients. Take a look. If you are not looking at these things, you would not see it. If you don't, if you don't have an eye for it, you are not going to see. It. And he has given us a very, very good, I, I think it, it, this is a paper that, you know, try and reach out to it. And if you, if you need a copy of it, I will, I will send it to you. You need to read this. It, it's really, really eye-opening for me. Uh, as I as I, I manage cases on a daily basis, the key to diagnosis is the, the maxillary incisor edge, especially if just for the you know for the anterior region uh, or the maxillary region. You want to know if you're not looking for it. Like I said, you wouldn't see it. For 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 young folks, they show about three millimeters of the incisor edge. For Folks um, around 50, they show about one millimeter. For people over 60, they're almost less than one millimeter. So the, the incisor edge is, is... So when you're looking at your patient, these are things you need to see. You know, before you start doing any treatments, can you take a look at the incisor edge? Look at the, the, the cervical edge position in terms of the, the length of the central, the, the maxillary central incisor is key. That tooth is key to the success of all the treatment that you do. What is the average length? The average length is about 10 millimeters and width about 8.5. So when you have that, measure that for your patient and um, the smile line. Does your patient have a high smile line? Does your patient have a medium? About 70% of patients come with a, a medium smile line. So it's in between while some, um, the rest have a low smile line. Others have a um, really gummy smile. Does your patient have a gummy smile? Do they want their gummy smile back? Do they, do they, do they, do they, don't, they don't want that altered? Or do they don't want, you know, so if you don't want that altered, is your uh, prosthesis tissue junction going to be showing when they smile? <laughs> you, don't, you don't want that showing. So, so, so these are things you need to calculate. So you, Classify your patients based on this criteria. Do they display a lot of, of gingiva? What of the maxillary lip support? When you look at all these, you're able to classify and you can tell exactly what your patient needs, a fix or a removable. If your patient needs real big lip support, then you should be thinking more of a removable prosthesis. It kind of helps you to decide. So this is still diagnosis, trying to diagnose what they have such that you can decide what material you would use in, 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 in giving them a favorable outcome. In his, in his, in his work, Dr. Bidra and uh, Dr. Ega, they did have uh, four classifications, um, one to four, uh, where based on the amount of tissue loss, if you've lost a lot of tissue, so are you going to be replacing? So the prosthesis you're making, if there's a lot of tissue loss, then you should add um, a pink portion of it. So your tooth, because sometimes I see a lot of uh, work where uh, a pink portion is not added and the tooth looks longer than, not, than usual, than, you know, in, in that position, and it looks not very sightly. So um, if, is this a class one patient you're dealing with? Where is the position of the anterior teeth in relation to the residual reach? For class one patient, is inferior and anterior. Is that the kind of patient that you have? Where is the smile line? For what, like I said earlier, class one patient require a prosthesis contour and lip support. Those patients, they require lip support. So you'll probably be looking at uh, a, a prosthesis that have a, a pink portion. For moderate, there's no for moderate uh, class class two cases, which is a moderate uh, tissue loss. Uh, the prosthesis contour is needed. Uh, aesthetic tooth proportions are added, but lip support is not accounted for. In class four cases, sometimes you just have a convert. If your patient presents at the as a certain class, you you want to try to convert them. You want to adjust reduce bone such that you can, or you can convert the patient into a favorable class that requires, uh, that does not require the addition of a pink portion. 
So you really have to take a critical look. And all those things come from the previous slide we just looked, where you look at um, the smile line in size or age. Like I said, these factors that we, we, have, we have looked at, the sleep line, the tooth display, the, the need for, for facial support, it helps you to decide what kind of prosthesis your patient is going to need. So it's, it's saying if you don't have, it depends on the space that your patient presents with, um, you, that kind of helps you determine um, what prosthesis you're going to give the patient. If, if, if there's a low smile line, if there's if little to display, if there's no need for lip support or facial support, you should be looking more at a fixed prosthesis. Uh, I know some people, you know, most people come to you and they want um, um, two things that really um, uh, Dr. Bidra will always say um, gives you a determination. Uh, they either come with bone, okay, or they come with money. So those two things, those two things, I'm telling you, are critical in every case that you treat. Some people want, some people have bone, but they don't have money. And some people have money, and they don't have bone. You know, so you're looking at a combination, you need a combination of both. Because there are some, so many good things you want to do, but you don't have the bone for it. I want implant, I want implant, I want fixed portions, but you don't have the bone. Can we place bone? Is this something that another person should be doing in terms of the bone graft? You know, do we need to place bone first? So if the person has money and, um, and has uh, no bone and, and you, there's a possibility of being able to augment the tissues, then let's go for it. But those two factors really come to play. A high smile line, excessive tooth uh, exposure, and, and, and if lip support is necessary, you're talking about you need, uh, you need to convince your patient. You are going to, you know, it will, it will pay you more to have a removal prosthesis. I know you want, you want a fixed prosthesis, but what you present with, it does not go well for, for what you want. So being able to convince your patient, you know, to do the right thing you know, based on the features that they have. This is the space that they present with. What are the interhatch space? If they, if you, you know, if, if, you, if you have, too much space, more than 15 millimeters, and the um, patient is moving towards a class three case, and uh, the mucosa is thin and mobile, you know, I, I think it will pay you more to convince your patient to stick with something removable rather than something fixed, because once you go something fixed with a, with, with a skeletal class three, uh, buccal inclination and concavity uh, is gonna be, is gonna be really tough trying to give a fixed prosthesis. So what the patient pres presents with their, their biologic factors help you in making you up your mind uh, what they're going to have. This is um, a, a pictorial from the paper that the key distinction between the classes that I just talked about is the amount of space. So the space um, that the patient presents it kind of determines what class they belong and what you can give them. So you can actually, okay, the patient presents the, the class. So if the patient does not have bone in class one, uh, you are going to need some, you know, some pink portions. So class one, class two, and class three, uh, 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 and class four all require uh, a pink portion to be added to the prosthesis. And this is, this is pretty standard these days. That is the only way it's going to look is going to look nice. It's going to look give the patient a self confidence and type of function, and you know, aesthetic, especially in the aesthetic zone, these are critical. Something you want to have in front of you every day when you look at your patient: is this patient a class three patient? Is this patient a class two? Can I convert this class class four patient into a class two case with a pink portion? And you know, so all that um, should be in your uh, at your fingertips. The crown height space is considered the key uh, vertical parameter in treatment planning. Is the distance from the occlusal plane to the crest of the uh, alveolar region, posterior region, and from the incisor arch in, in, in the anterior region. And sometimes you can measure it in the mouth, just measuring the, the you know, just the the, the 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 length, not necessarily the space is volume, as I said earlier. But in terms of looking at someone, period, where you can 
using a perio probe just make a little you can, you can you know when you look at the space you need to consider a vertical and horizontal dimension in terms of the width and and the length uh, it's something you should do at all times my patient comes in and says you know what i doc i i need i need you know it's a regular word fix me up can can i can i do this do I have available space? Is there space available to fix this? If space is not available, is space attainable? Can it be done by grafting? And it goes back to, does the patient have the money for it? Can it be done? And you have to look at it in terms of the, the, the vertical and the horizontal dimensions. Um, I, I did this case in a consultation with uh, Perio folks and uh, we decided that he was going to need some graft. This, the, he, the individual had this implant placed in the past and this implant was not part of his, the implant was just hanging there. It's not touching anything, you know, because they placed the implant without even considering what I had enough space, what I had, you know, what, what I had to, to be in function. So they play, he invested thousands of dollars on an implant that is not functional. That could have been avoided if you know you looked at it from from the from from, from the end and said, okay, yes, you don't have you need to build up. So we are taking the approach, okay, we need to build up the space. The width here, if you notice, there's a little defect right here. And um, took out that implant, placed some bone there, allowing things to heal, and hopefully we can bulk it up because you want your implant to be surrounded by bone. You know, you don't want any threads showing. You, know, you need at least vocally, uh, lingually, you need like two millimeters of, of, of bone all around. If there's any thread, you know, you, is this going to last? <laughs> you know, so you back to the question, is this case going to last? If Do I have what it takes to have a, a, a good long-term health of, of the final prosthesis? So here we are, we need some numbers. For a cemented crown, you need um, about seven millimeters from the top of the implant, from the top of the implant right here to your opposing dentition. You need at least seven, at least. This is the minimum. It could be more. If you see on the right hand side, this is on a good day. This is this is everybody's dream. Where but but for screw, you know, cement retain you can have at least seven millimeters. On a good day, nine millimeters is just awesome. But you can get at least, so if you don't have seven millimeters, you know, should you be doing that? Because if you don't, you're going to compromise in the material. You're going to be compromised in the look. You're going to compromise in, in, in just, you know, just the function. And you, you're going to compromise the interact space and at the end of the day, something is going to fail. So having the right space is just critical. For a screw retained, um, we, can, we, can, we can gain some leverage, some, 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 some room there because it allows you, uh, for a screw retained, like one fixture, a screw retained um, crown requires less vertical space. So this is where we have to, especially if you are you're in a position where you don't have much space, then a, you know, and, and it's in the posterior because sometimes you don't want the in the anterior region you don't want this screw access hole to be showing in you know especially in the incisor area where contact is being made or showing through in front you know you know so that that is where you know you should be asking yourself is this something you can achieve with a screw retain? Well, because you you if you don't have much space then five millimeter which is the minimum you require for that is something you can use. There's a paper by uh, um, Carpenteri and Calvaro and Greenstein, very, it just came out uh, not too long ago, where they talked about the hierarchy of retroactive space required for different implant prosthesis. It gives you the numbers right there. I'm gonna start from the end, which is the fixed screw retain you need <laughs> you need at least 15 if, if things are going to go well you know i know sometimes you look at the ko uh, uh, this is a fixed case do you have enough space do you have can you have more at least 15 millimeters 
from the edge to the implant um, platform. For, for, for cases that where you need a bar, I'm gonna put a short slide where the, the photograph so you can appreciate um, the bars. You need at least, you know, so many, so many uh, studies out there. Uh, and this, 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 this paper did not a systematic review, but did put together a couple um, cases that have been done. And you can, you can get to see an average of, uh, for the bars you need like um, 13, some, some papers say 13 to 14. For the unsplitted overdenture, um, uh, you see the numbers are all over the place, but I think you know, having at least 10 to 12 is just safe. For the cement retained, like we said, seven to eight millimeters. For screw retained, uh, for abutment level prosthesis, 7.5. Why screw retained implant level, uh, the least is a minimum, minimum requirement is uh, four to five millimeters. So this, this, this is a case of the bars you need a minimum of, of uh, 13 to 14 millimeters. This is a removable prosthesis um, using a bar. Um, while for the individual supported ones, you need, uh, because the bar it has a lot more, you know, so this is the bar here. It introduces a lot more, uh, it needs more space. So it needs about, you know, two, one to two millimeters more of space. And if you're gonna do that, you need at least 13 um, to be able to use that for your patient, and this this is this is everybody's um this is this is what you want to do. In most of the cases people are looking for fixed cases, and this is what is both you know if you look at TV ads, uh, okay, same day you know do you have enough? Do you have fifteen millimeters of clearance? Would you be able to achieve it by 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 cutting bone or and, and reducing to have this? If you don't have the space, he's gonna, you're going to have some problems with it. That's what you know, the research shows and cases, just from experience, that is what you're going to have problems if you don't have enough space. And in terms of the contour, you know, I know Dr. Uh, in an earlier presentation talked about the, the, the convexity or the concavity of, of the interface. You know, all that comes into play, but in terms of the length, the space, do you have enough space? Where is the position of the implant? Where is it, where, where is the occlusion? Is it, is it more, sometimes for the, for the overdentures, you want the implants to be more lingual such that the person's not biting over the access hole. All this uh, to say um, enhances patient satisfaction. Making the right choices, picking the right material, based on the patient's budget. I just want to go through a couple, uh, uh, just a case here. Uh, it's an injury, a 25 year old comes into the clinic, he said, okay, I, I, need, I need some teeth. I had a, was in a road traffic accident and we're looking at it and he was, um, and, um, do we, do we, what was the first thing you're gonna do? You're gonna gather some information, like what is do, take some pictures. Radiographs. Patient presents number the canine and the lateral uh, were fractured. So the endo, the endodontist did determine that it was not restorable. Because um, you, you're looking at these, okay, why well, can we do a post core crown and all that? But um, they did say it was fractured, and so they had to take it out. He had a significant trauma uh, to that area of his face and broke some part of his, of his bones there, and um, we had to extract those teeth and did some grafting. And you know, I, I, we, 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 we took a CBCT to be able to say, okay, how much space? So this is like a simple, it looked like a simple case. Do we have enough space? Do you have enough, how many implants can go in there? Do we have enough space? And I was looking at the canine. Okay, if you put a tooth there, is it gonna be, if you look at the other, the other canine, just slightly, slightly, uh, I, I had to explain to the patient, we don't have enough space. We will need to plasty, we need to reduce this canine um, just a little bit uh, to create room so that there'll be no interference. Because when I, like I said, you know, once you have cases like this, you need to uh, just take the cast, pour it up, CBCT, so please, these are just some, um, 
the implants we place, you know, digitally on the computer. I was, okay, yes, this is this size of implant, this, how much space, you can calculate it. It has uh, 23 millimeters of length in there, the bone thickness, this after the bone graft has been done and, and you can place it digitally and um, measure it exactly. Because you are, you are, this case was a guided case, so there's no, really no room for much error. Uh, and, and, and you calculate exactly how much where is going the direction such that um, all driven by the outcome. This is where the, we want the crown. This is where we want the crowns to be. And so this is the direction it should be. And, and this is how much bone he has. And so, so for, for uh, just a little, little lesson here, um, between two implants, you need uh, at least uh, three millimeters in the B portion three millimeters, you, you sh do you have it? Do you have three millimeters? If you're gonna place two implants there, do you have clear two, three millimeters between the two implants? And between the implants and the adjacent teeth, you need 1.5. So you need to find, do you have a space? If you're gonna put, this is what we intend to put uh, uh, based on the fact that the space is available and you calculate it, it's, it, it, it's a lot of measurements a lot of measurements involved and it's okay, yes, we can achieve this because we have the space is available. And if the space was not available, they have, we did some grafting and we, we could attain the space um, that we needed for this restoration. Determine the space that you need. And I, I explained to the patient where, you know, because sometimes you know, if you don't explain to your patient that you're grinding on the other, on the opposing teeth, you know, that's what happens. <laughs> I, I had a friend of mine was telling me that, you know, my dentist was grinding on my other teeth, you know, because when they put the final prosthesis, it didn't fit, you know. So you need to explain to the patient, this is what is going to happen. Uh, this is the space. These are the constraints we have. Um, and um, we're going to plasty for us to be able to put um, two teeth there. We're going to have to reduce this teeth a little bit. I mean, sometimes the, the, the reduction is drastic, where without doing a, you know um, endo on the tooth, you can't really adjust because sometimes you adjust up to the point that you get to the pulp, and the patient needs to understand that. Establishing the final position of the prosthetic teeth, it wax up. Okay, this is what this is. So you place the teeth there, and I look at it, and it's very thin. Um, and um, walking backwards, so you put the tooth there, you do a wax up, and this is what you're going to have. So you walk backwards to ascertain the restorative volume. It um, saves you a lot of headaches. This is during the day uh, of the implant placement. Everything. Uh, sometimes, yeah, I was reading a study about discrepancies between surgical guides and um, what actually happens <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the mouth. You know, sometimes you know, some of the guides are not as accurate as, 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 as is presumed. There's, you know, but to, to a large extent, things are pretty much the same. There was no more surprise in this case. And uh, this case, was, you know, so we're still working on it. Um, we have um, waiting for, for things to in integrate and uh, uh, looking forward to of finishing up this case for this patient. Uh, this is one case I, I need you, I need you, if you are at home, uh, you're gonna be, this is your patient, okay? How are you gonna manage this patient? And uh, this is where we're gonna, I'm gonna draw uh, a cotton on today's uh, uh, presentation. Um, this is your patient. Uh, patient walks in, just 70 year old patient walks in and says, Doc, I need something. I need something quick. I need something. I can't live like this. The patient had a bridge um, from canine to canine, and the bridge broke, and um, and the patient was, you know, the, it went somewhere, and they gave her this Essex. Uh, this is this is all the patient has, um, just to replace the missing teeth. And what would you do? I want you to just, uh, we're going to have some time here to talk about this case. If you're um, interested in speaking, just lift your hand and I'm, I'm going to call you. So this is where, so this is, this is still the patient. Um, this is how much space. You know, when we're talking about, this is what really inspired me to talk about restorative space. Do we have enough space? You know, so I, I go back to my question. Do you have enough bone? And, uh, and uh, sometimes you have to be realistic. 
in terms of does the patient need lip support? You see, all those questions we ask ourselves, where, what is the smile line? You know, what is the, the, the how much of gingiva shows? Uh, can we achieve, is there, what's the OVD? What's the, the vertical dimension of, you know, of occlusion? You know, do we need to open the, you know, if you notice this teeth here, um, this is the, the premolar looks short because I think, you know, you have to compromise the material. This is not the right size of, you know, because they made the prosthesis to fit the space and not necessarily, so it was, it was you, you adjust it to fit what the patient has. Um, it will come with, with its own problems. Things are gonna break, it's not gonna last. Uh, you know, remember when I said earlier, um, we want long-term health. So this is your patient and she has broken her, her bridge from canine to canine and she wants something fixed. And she's like, doc, what can you give me? And how soon I need it badly? What are you going to do? I'm sure you say you want to look at, I know we need a lot more information um, than this, but just imagine uh, this is the case. This is the patient in, in um, I, I'm looking at the lower teeth. They all have funny shapes. The contour is funny because it was made to fit. So it was adjusted to fit, you know, It was just made to fit, not necessarily what, not, not an ideal situation. I look at, look at the crowns again, um, shortened, funny looking crowns um, just uh, to fit. The patient needs bone taken out. For a fixed option, what is the transition? You know, how are we going to move from um, where we are now to a final prosthesis? What would be your treatment plan? And for those who are going to take, um, for those of us who are going to take a, a course, to do an online, to do the online course, um, you have to, it's an open case, okay? <laughs> so you, you have to report on what you think can be done to this case. Just say, Charlie, just say, okay, what, how am I going to treat this case? What are the steps I'm going to follow? Based on what we've talked about today. Um, and if you want to do a report on it, and um, we'll talk about it, and, and I, I know we have faculty here who are going to help us to go through this material, but it's going to be, everybody's going to do, anybody who's going to take the course is going to take this, this case. This is going to be your patient and you can, you know, whatever information you need for this case will provide. And um, there's the x-ray for the patient in terms of um, looking at all the teeth, is it, which of them are, are, are they restorable? Um, which are you going to keep? Are you going to keep any? Um, something to think about. What would you propose? Would you propose, um, based on the patient's presentation, would you propose a removable option or you propose a fixed option? Are you going to, is the patient going to have, because if you look at the bone, you, you, you know, you, would you provide something that needs, that has a flange? Because without any bone reduction, would you put a, there's no way a flange, you know, I don't know, I'm just, uh, put a flange there. Do we have enough space? Would you increase the OVD? Would she need pre-prosthetic surgery? What, what, what's going to be your treatment plan? Um, this uh, continues to be an interesting case for me as I take a look. Uh, we'll tell you exactly what happened in another presentation. But for the case of, uh, for, for, the, for the sake of just uh, learning today, uh, this is what we're going to discuss. If you want to talk about it, please go ahead. I'll give you an opportunity to speak. And, um, but taking good records is, is key and determining what route you're going to take based on the space. Can you, is space available? Is space attainable? Some questions to ask ourselves. I'm going to go on through another case here uh, just to show you what was done. So this patient shows up. is a case uh, of a, a colleague of mine, uh, and um, very interesting case. So, so, so you see, so implants were placed just like this. The patient shows up like this, and somehow <laughs> implants were already there. So the patient has three implants uh, for number eight, and uh, there's two central incisors and lateral. So the, the implants were placed without thinking of 
restoring this 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 mouth, um, but implants were placed. So this is what I'm saying in terms of in terms of um, doing your your diagnosis, in terms of doing your 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 treatment planning, in terms of is this something you can finish? Is this something you can do? I know sometimes placing the implant is like oh it's easy, you just place the implant and okay. I can you restore this teeth? Is it going to be easy? What classification is this? If you look at it, it's, it's, this more, looks more like, you know, in, in the beginning, we talk about the ACP classification in terms of the bone loss and the bite. The, you know, the, the bite is collapsed. You're probably going to need to um, change, determine. So for every case, determine either the existing or potential restorative space with respect to the vertical dimension of occlusion. So you, you, you for every patient you have, you, okay, listen, this is this is the existing. Uh, this is where we can go with it. And there are several methods that have been put forth um, for what we talked about earlier in terms of uh, the aesthetics, the the, the smile line, the, uh, the the pronunciation of certain words, F and V, just um, trying to find out the interclusal space, the phonetics, just facial contour, lip contours. Determine the video. So for this case, it was determined that um, the, they were going to increase. I mean, so that's the only way. So a device was made, uh, a bite was made, uh, closer device was made to increase. And the patient had to wear this for a long time to get used to, because you notice there's a lack of posterior support on, on, on the left-hand side. And, uh, so the patient had to wear this to increase the video uh, before anything could be done. So that's the first thing for that particular case. Um, so if you notice the implants were already there um, and the implants were placed without, without uh, an end in mind. You know, so, so this um, astute clinician uh, from Ohio State, they did uh, so the case they did and um, this was a device that the patient had to wear to, because you notice the patient is, you know, had a collapse bite. So in, in this, is, this is the day uh, decision was made. It was already made to open the bite. And if you're opening the bite, I mean, you're talking about a full mouth case of crowns. And um, this was uh, what was attainable and achievable for this patient. And if you notice, you know, on here, there was some loss. Um, I think grafting was not an option. So, um, a pink portion of, of a of prosthesis was, was, was determined um, would be the best option for this patient, so a class one case here. And this was uh, the final outcome um, that the patient had. Uh, he seemed to have wonderful life afterwards. He became <laughs> happily ever after. All right. Thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. Uh, like I said, uh, if you have any questions, this will be the time to ask. And uh, if you have any suggestion as to how to treat any of those cases, if you have any, please let me know. Yeah, I took a look on our Facebook page and I'm not uh, seeing any questions just yet on that. But very interesting cases. <laughs> yes. Uh, Shade. Shade says uh, ortho first. Shade, are you able to speak? Hold on, Shade. Let me see if I can get you to say, but what, what are your comments? Do you have any comments? <laughs> I think uh, my, my comment would be... Um, First of all, you know, uh, like was mentioned last week as well, I completely agree with you of doing your homework and also making sure that your goals align with the patient's goals as well and understanding what that patient is um, willing to do. And, you know, like you had this last one who said, you know, I want fixed, you know, but do you like the appearance of those lower teeth? Because that's my concern also, you know, um, those teeth, they don't look that great. And it's like, okay, is your better option to do a fixed hybrid over a fixed hybrid? Um, because do you want to save those lower teeth that look that way? Or is that patient okay with you, you know, 
crowning or doing a veneer or whatever you might need to do to make those teeth look nice so that they look nice with the upper teeth because over time, you know, you're uh, due to gravity, your lower teeth are going to be seen more. So, you know, um, helping the patient understand what you see and helping them understand the long term is really important. All right. I, I, you know, go back to, I don't want you to do crowns. So you ask yourself, you know, obviously somebody, you have some amount of money because when it comes to this, you know, you know, money becomes an issue because if, if money was not an issue and, 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 and you just love that. Uh, Dr. Dr. Shadi, are you there? Yes. Please go ahead. Go ahead and just uh, give me your comments. Can you show the case again, please? Okay. Yes, this one. Was it this one or the first one? And this one. Okay. Yes, um, we, we can see that um, de definitely we need um, full mouth x-rays, um, all the records that we definitely need to take before we start this case. Um, but just looking at it, we can see that there is very little interarch distance um, the arches are totally collapsed. So we'll definitely need to raise the bite to achieve this. And for um, and you can see a lot of super eruption, especially on the lower anterior. So also on the lower will be um, um, advisable um, so that those anterior teeth can be lowered. Because if not, we won't be able to get very good aesthetics at the end of the day okay that and is then we can end up um we're definitely going to end up raising the bite too because you can see the um the sizes of the premolars are not the, the sizes are not adequate you're right you're right I, I guess and that's where the problem came so you said also first and um uh, just in some 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 form of intrusion, uh, that's given the fact that if they are if they are um, in terms of um, if they are their pop states are okay. okay. Yes. We we need more photographs though to to see some more of these things. But I think that's a um, she, and she's a seventy year old patient. Okay. Yes, I I have <laughs> I've seen um, one or two seventy year old patients that have actually gone for auto. Oh, interesting. That's good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I really, I, I, I saw you all there. And uh, what, what do you do, uh, Dr. Dr. Shadi? I'm um, a general practitioner, but I do also, and I do most phases of dentistry. Okay. And you're in the Lagos area? Yes, I'm in Lagos. Okay. Although I used to practice out there. I see. Okay. Uh, does anybody have another comment? Thank you so much, Dr. Shadi. I, I really, really appreciate your, your jumping in. Um, is there any other comment? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gasson, Gasson, are you there? Gassan is um, is a certified lab. Let, let me see. I'm sure Gassan is there. If you want to, if you want to make any comments, um, please go ahead. Um, Gassan, are you there? Hi, doctor. Yes. Good. Uh, good. Uh, good How morning. Good morning from the West Coast. So. Uh, <laughs> How are you doing? Yeah. All so right. a nice presentation, doctor. And I uh, just want to add. That's uh, when we do full arch implant, uh, we do the acrylic first. And uh, from the acrylic, we do the body on that acrylic to determine the tie base's length, as you mentioned. And from there, we can determine, is it going to be zirconia or acrylic with bar? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's, that's what I want to add from uh, the lab perspective to decide for the vertical dimension case. 
Okay, so uh, do, do you make any uh, in the lab? Do you have do you make any uh, uh, bone reduction guides? Sometimes when the doctor wants, but mostly the 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 prosthodontist do that kind of work because they there is labs with them always, so they do that kind of work. And uh, but sometimes we just cut the the stone model, like three millimeters or four and show it to them and we go from there okay all right yes yeah yeah it's important to to have a lab for continue daily cases like this okay thank you thank you so much sure thank you doctor dr dr Ker uh, dr Bini, are you still there Karen? Dr. Bini, can you hear me? Anyway, well, we're looking forward to you uh, having, we're going to be back here tomorrow uh, with, um, with, uh, Hello? yes, go ahead. Uh, Karen, I, I just wanted to see if you had any comments. No, um, I, well, it was a very good presentation. Sorry, I'm having some connection difficulties, so I had to log out and log in again. Okay. Um, I missed some of your presentations. But um, what I can say is, is that I think an important thing about this is, I mean, these are really difficult cases. This is why we specialize. And I can't, you know, overstate um, how important getting all the information you can possibly get. And also the importance of multidisciplinary treatment planning. So um, I know you did mention those things, but I, I, must, I must say that is so, so important with these kinds of cases. Yes, yes. Anyway, thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Karen. It's been, it's been just thrilling having you. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this has become an interesting thing now for around the world where the world has become a village and, um, and uh, on, on, on a day where um, I, I remember Wakanda today because of uh, Chadwick and, and his passing. But uh, uh, we can, in, in the midst of where we are, in the midst of coronavirus or whatever, be able to come together and, and, and help ourselves grow um, in our profession is uh, wonderful for me. Uh, well, looking forward to tomorrow um, where we're going to have an, a continuation in the series. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate having you on. Sable, Dr. Sable, you did, you are, you are a wonderful um, compare. <laughs> <laughs> Proud to co-facilitate with you. Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you so much, guys. Uh, 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 we'll be in touch uh, tomorrow and we'll continue on the 5th uh, with Dr. Dr. Bini. Uh, she's going to be presenting on the 5th of, uh, of uh, September. Have a wonderful day. Oh, is it, let me see. Any comments here? Let me see if there's any comments. All right. All right. You guys take care. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 